Today's topic is on thermal energy <clears throat> and heat transfer. So we're going to start looking at that other kind of energy that we've been ignoring up to this point, <clears throat> not the mechanical kind of motion and, and potential energy, elastic or gravitational. But now we're going to start looking at all the little particles that are jiggling around and how is that energy transferred and stored. When you're studying energy, heat energy, one of the really important laws is the first law of thermodynamics. It's really a fundamental law. It says energy cannot be created or destroyed. <clears throat> energy can be transferred into or out of a system by two methods. One of them we've already discussed, and that's work. We've defined work as force times change in distance. And when a system provides a force that moves some object through a distance, well, we know that, that we have lost energy. The system has lost energy by doing that work. The other way that energy can be transferred into or out of a system is through heat. We're going to abbreviate heat Q, and we'll quantify this a little bit later. Here's how you can define heat. Heat really is just a method of energy transfer. So I don't really like to use the word heat. I actually like to use the word in, as a verb, heating, because heating is a way that you can move energy around. Heat is the quantity of energy that's done through heating or transferred through heating. And heat energy is transferred due to a difference in temperature. It has nothing to do with force and distance. It's just due to a difference in temperature. So if I have an object here and another object here, and this object has a high temperature, and this object has a low temperature, energy is going to be transferred from one to the other. And the amount of energy that gets transferred, well, that's what we call heat. So going back to the first law of thermodynamics, it says that energy can't be created or destroyed. Now, if you take a system, a closed box that surrounds something in the universe, what that means for this system is the total amount of energy that's in here can never change unless one of two things happens. One is energy could go to or from the surroundings by work. Another thing that could happen is energy could go to or from the surroundings because of a temperature difference, in other words, by heating. So we could rewrite the law, the first law of thermodynamics, to say that if there ever is a change in energy, a delta E, it would have to follow this pattern. Delta E is the sum of the Q plus the W. So generally, we would define Q that makes the energy of the system go up as positive. Same thing for work. And if the system loses energy, what we call that negative. As I said before, we already know how to quantify work. Work is just the product of force times distance. How do we quantify heat? Well, to quantify heat, we need to talk about a couple of related ideas. One of them is called heat capacity. Heat capacity of a system is the ratio of energy absorbed to how much its temperature changes. So heat capacity is defined this way. The ratio of energy absorbed, this is going to be in terms of heating, divided by the change in its temperature. Well, here's an example problem that makes use of that. Uh, the question here says that a rock has a heat capacity of 35.4 joules per degree C. Its temperature goes up by 36 degrees C, and the question is, how much energy did it absorb through heating? Well, here's the relevant equation. We know that heat capacity is defined as the ratio of the heat flow over the temperature change. So if we're trying to find Q, that's what we're looking for here, we'll multiply delta T by both sides to solve for it. So Q is heat capacity times delta T. Well, our heat capacity is 35.4 joules per degree C. We're multiplying that by our temperature change, which is 36 degrees C. You can see the degrees C are going to drop out, and then that'll give us joules per energy unit. Numerically, the answer is 1,270 joules. Another related concept is specific heat. It's like heat capacity, except for it's not for a whole object, but just for part of an object. In other words, per unit mass. So specific heat capacity, C, is heat capacity divided by mass. So it's to take the whole total heat capacity of the whole object, divide by, by its mass. Well, heat capacity was the ratio of Q to temperature change. So specific heat is Q divided by mass times delta T. Substances that have high specific heats tend to resist temperature change really well. Water, for example, as you see in this picture of kids on the beach here, 
water has a specific heat of 4.184 joules for every gram to go up a degree C. That turns out to be fairly high. In fact, it's really high compared to almost all substances. And so that means it takes a lot of solar energy coming in from the sun to make the temperature go up even a small amount. Well, that regulates the surrounding temperature. And so people like to vacation or live around large bodies of water like the Pacific Ocean in this picture. On the other hand, you would make a frying pan out of something that has a really low specific heat because you want it to heat up fast. For iron, specific heat is 0.444 joules per gram per degree C. It's like a tenth of what the specific heat of water is. And so the iron, the energy is transferred from the fire into the pot really rapidly. And that's what we want it to do. Here's another example problem. Gold is specific heat is given. 0.129 joules per gram per degree C. Question here is if a 30, 30 gram piece of gold experiences a temperature drop of 79.2 degrees C, how much energy did it lose through heating? Well, specific heat is defined as Q divided by mass times change in temperature. And here we're trying to find Q, so we'll solve for it. Multiplying both sides by mass times delta T gives you this equation. Q is equal to C M delta T. So let's plug in numbers and get our answer here. Our specific heat for gold is 0.129 joules per gram per degree C. The mass is 30 grams. And the change in temperature, well, it's 79.2 degrees C. When we look at what happens to the units, both the degrees C and the grams cancel out. And that leaves us just with units of joules. Do the arithmetic. 307 joules were absorbed. Specific heat is used to measure heat through a science called calorimetry. Calorie is an old word for heat, caloric actually, and meter or metra or anything that has METR in it <clears throat> means measurement. So this is heat measurement. That's what this science is, measurement of energy flow. In calorimetry, we carefully define two parts of the universe. We divide the universe actually into two parts. One is the system. This is the part of the universe for which you're measuring energy flow, the part of the universe that you're interested in studying. And the rest of the universe is what we call the surroundings. Now, the rest of the universe is a pretty big space, and so you can't really get a handle on what's going on in the whole universe. So most of the time what we do is work quickly, and we use insulation to restrict the universe to a manageable size for the purposes of our experiment. The device that we, we get when we, when we do that is called a calorimeter, a heat measurer. And this is the basic idea behind a calorimeter. There are all kinds of them, but the schematic for all of them, actually, <clears throat> kind of looks like this. You take a space and you insulate it really well. You we could do this with, like, foam or something like that, or a vacuum bottle would do a good job. So, you, so that heat flow is, is sort of restricted. Not totally, not fully, but... If you're working fast enough, you can ignore the amount of heat that will make it through that heavy insulation. And then you have your system inside here, whatever your system is. It could be a chemical reaction. It could be an object, whatever. And then energy is going to flow out of that system or into that system, depending on what kind of a system it is. If it's cold, energy will go into it. If it's hot, energy will come out of it. But where does it come from? Well, this is the key. Inside here, you put water or oil, or something else whose specific heat you, you know very well. And then you can, because you know how much energy goes into something whose specific heat you understand, because Q is equal to specific heat times mass times delta T, well, since the energy can't come from the surroundings, the only place it can come from is the system. So that allows you to measure how much energy came into or out of the system. And so you have to be able to measure temperature, so there's typically a thermometer in here. And you will weigh the water bath inside there. And you'll also probably weigh something about the system, too. And you have to know the specific heat for water or oil or whatever is in there. That's essential. How this works is through a process called the law of heat transfer. This is what makes this possible. The law of heat transfer says that Q for the system has to be equal to and opposite Q for the surroundings. That has to be the case. And... That's because there's no place else for energy to come from if you have this well-insulated boundary. 
Now, if you just get rid of the well-insulated boundary and just imagine the surroundings to be the whole rest of the universe, then you don't have to worry about insulation or anything. This is definitely true. If a system loses energy, since energy can't be created or destroyed, it had to have gone into the surroundings. Here's an example problem. We've got a calorimeter. It's made of iron. The iron has a mass of 150 grams. It has 300 grams of water in it. The temperature of the calorimeter and the water is 20 degrees C. A 450-gram piece of metal that's at 100 degrees C is added, and the temperature goes up to 30 degrees C. What's the specific heat of the metal? Let's draw a little picture of what we have going on here. We've got this iron calorimeter, so this is basically this tub made of iron, and we're going to assume that it's well insulated so that, so that there can't be any heat flow from the inside, uh, from the outside. And then inside is some water. And then inside that is going to be your system, which happens to be this piece of, of metal. And energy is going to flow from the piece of metal out, because the piece of metal is at a higher temperature, until they both reach the same temperature. Now here's the data. The, the water has a mass of 300 grams, and it's got a starting temperature, an initial temperature of 20 degrees C, and its final temperature is the final temperature of everything here, which is 30 degrees C. The iron, we also have data about that. The iron weighs 150 grams. Its initial temperature is the same as that of the water, 20 degrees C, and its final temperature is also 30 degrees C. Here's what we know about the metal. We know its mass. It's a 450 gram piece of metal, and its initial temperature we know is 100 degrees C. Its final temperature, well, it's the same as everything. 30 degrees C. Now here's how we can use the law of heat transfer to figure this out. The Q for the system, the energy lost by the piece of metal, has to be equal and opposite to the Q for the surroundings. And the surroundings here happen to be the water and the iron that the calorimeter is made of. So let's set that up a little bit different way. We know that Q is equal to C times M times delta T. So let's do that for the system first. C of the metal times mass of the metal times the temperature change for the metal has to be equal to, now here's where the surroundings come in. The surroundings include water, so specific heat of, I'm going to use W for water, mass of water, times the change in temperature for the water. But also included is the iron. So specific heat of iron times mass of iron times delta T for iron. I have to get that all included in there. Well, what we're trying to find here is the specific heat of the metal. That's what we're looking for. So we can solve this equation for that by just dividing both sides by mass of metal times the change in temperature of metal. So C for the metal is going to be minus C for water times mass of water times delta T for water plus C for iron, mass of iron, delta T of iron, all divided by mass of the metal times the change in temperature for the metal. So now we can put some information in here and solve this. Well, C for water is 4.184 joules per gram per degree C. The mass of the water, it said it was 300 grams. The temperature change for the water, well, it started at 20 and it went up to 30, so that's a 10 degrees C change. Iron, 0.444 joules per gram per degree C. Mass of iron, it was 150 grams. The temperature change for iron is the same as that for the water. The mass of the piece of metal, 450 grams. And the temperature change, well, it started at 100, went down to 30, so that represents a 70 degrees C change. Grams cancel out, so do degrees C, so it's going to be joules plus joules. And then down here we have grams times degrees C. So the specific heat for our metal is going to end up having units of joules per gram per degree C. Let's do the number crunching, and here's what you come up with, 0.420 joules per gram per degree C. It's a number that's reasonable. It's sort of close to what iron is, actually. It seems like it could be a metal. 